Good morning, everyone, and thanks for attending the latest installment of our Now Next series. For this special event on the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency's Cyber Essentials Toolkit. This program follows last month's Countering Ransomware webinar with Secretary of Homeland Security, Ali Mayorkas. Today, we intend to provide America's corporate executives and business owners with the cybersecurity essentials necessary to drive down and manage cyber risk. Since we spoke with Secretary Mayorkas, several high profile uh, and significant cyber attacks and ransomware incidents have highlighted the critical role of the private sector and corporate leaders in protecting and defending against these cyber threats. Together with the private sector's work, the government must take action to impose consequences on malicious actors in order to deter them from continuing their rampage. Business leaders must understand what they should do to defend their data and networks and foster a strong cyber posture in their business operations. Prepared organizations are more effective in detecting, responding to, and recovering from cyber intrusions. Ann Newberger, Deputy National Security Advisor for Cyber and Emerging Technology, laid out in an open memo uh, a few weeks back to America's corporate executives and business leaders five best practices that organizations should implement today. These practices are consistent with what the Chamber has been recommending for years. So we saw that as a very positive development. But here are the five. Number one, because passwords alone are routinely compromised, deploy multi-factor authentication. Number two, hunt for and block malicious network activity by deploying endpoint detection and response. Number three, encrypt data and communications so that if it's stolen, it's unusable. Number four, employ and empower a skilled security team to rapidly patch and share information. And number five, securely backup data, system images, and configurations and store them offline. These five practices, along with several others included in President Biden's executive order on improving the nation's cybersecurity, will significantly reduce the risk of a successful cyber attack. These practices will be most impactful and successful in organizations where business leaders prioritize cybersecurity alongside traditional business objectives. CEOs, boards of directors, and corporate security teams must be part of the cyber risk management culture. And to help organizations better understand this culture of cyber readiness, we brought in key leaders from CISA to overview and answer questions on their five pillars of cyber essentials. Later in the program, we'll welcome one of the Chamber's small business cybersecurity leaders in a question and answer session with the audience on specific ways small businesses can work to improve their cybersecurity posture. But before that, and kicking things off, we'll hear from Trent Frazier, Deputy Assistant Director of the Stakeholder Engagement Division in CISA. As the Deputy Assistant Director for Stakeholder Engagement, Mr. Frazier leads, in coordination with the Assistant Director, CISA's strategy to build, promote, and sustain strategic partnerships across industry, public sectors and institutions, and the international community. Before joining CISA, Mr. Frazier served as the Executive Director for the Office of Campaigns and Academic Engagement at DHS, where he represented the Secretary, the Deputy Secretary, and Department leadership in efforts to generate awareness on key national security issues. Trent will open our session today with an overview of the cyber essentials. After Trent completes his remarks, we'll turn to Bradford Wilkie, Senior Advisor for Stakeholder Engagement at CISA. Bradford developed partnerships across the private and, sec and private and public sectors to achieve strategic and operational collaboration. Uh, and, and many of you will also know he was the voice behind many of the CISA and FEMA calls that happened during the COVID, uh, initial COVID response. And uh, I was telling him before in the, in the uh, green room how much that we at the chamber and others appreciated the work that he uh, and his colleagues at CISA and, and throughout the government did in that those initial very chaotic days. So uh, Bradford, thank you for that. Bradford also served as the Acting Assistant Director for Stakeholder Engagement from June 2019 to October 2020 and was instrumental in standing up CISA during its infancy and for shaping the vision uh, and functions necessary for 21st century stakeholder engagement operations. Bradford also spent more than 10 years at the Software Engineering Institute's CERT division, where he created a suite of information security risk assessments. Bradford will discuss each of the pillars of the Cyber Essentials Toolkit in more detail and provide key insights into how business executives and other non-technical personnel can think about cybersecurity to achieve their business goals. Finally, we'll have Spencer Ferguson join us. 
Spencer is the founder and chief executive officer of Wasatch IT in the events in our final session. Spencer founded Wasatch in 2002 as a computer hardware and software reseller before later transforming the business into a managed services provider. The company is now the IT department for over 500 organizations and is Utah's largest locally owned outsourced IT firm. Spencer serves on the Chamber's Small Business Council and routinely serves as a voice for small business in programs like this and with policymakers on Capitol Hill. Spencer's on hand to conduct a small business question and answer session in conversation with Vince Fossey, Executive Director of Cyber Policy and Operations at the Chamber. Throughout today's program, we'll be encouraging audience participation in both terms of asking and answering your questions, but also in responding to several uh, online polling questions. So to get things started, I'm going to talk about the first question, uh, which will be uh, online for you to answer. The first poll question is this. What is your breaking point when it comes to how ransomware attacks would affect your organization? Please select one of the multiple choice responses and we'll reflect on your feedback in a few minutes. But now I'll turn things over to Trent Frazier for his opening remarks. Trent, the floor is yours. Well, good morning and thank you very much for this opportunity to be here today and for joining us in the introduction of the CISA Cyber Essentials. As you heard, my name is Trent Frazier. I'm the Deputy Assistant Director for Stakeholder Engagement here at the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA for short. While I won't use any of our time today to read out all of the work underway now within CISA, I do encourage you to visit us at CISA.gov and follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter, where you'll receive regular updates on new resources, products, and information that we're making available to help you protect your business from the cyber threats emerging across the world. When it comes to modern day cybersecurity risk, let me start by saying that your business success depends on your cyber readiness. From HR to marketing, sales to procurement and customer service, it is almost guaranteed that you rely on one or more digital platforms to facilitate the success of your business operations. The cyber essentials are a series of tools and practices that we've assembled working with the private sector. They're designed to give you a leadership-driven starting point toward what we consider the basics of organizational cyber readiness. We design these cyber essentials specifically for leaders of small organizations for whom cybersecurity is not part of your day-to-day -day work. These are a set of easy to adopt and understand community-endorsed cybersecurity practices that together constitute the basics. The Cyber Essentials also equip you as leaders with the right questions to ask and conversations to engage with your service providers and your staff in all aspects of your business to ensure that you're putting into practice a cyber readiness culture. The Cyber Essentials have six elements, each overlapping and contributing to an overall picture of your business level of cyber readiness. They are starting with you as leaders within your organization but also including your staff, your systems, your surroundings, your data, and finally, your crisis response. Now, throughout the presentation today, we'll use the phrase holistic approach. It is a core theme of the cyber essentials. This is what we mean by it. Getting outside of the IT silo and really addressing cybersecurity on a broader organizational level that considers how every member of your team does what's necessary to protect your organization. I'm going to quickly provide you with an overview of the single most important pillar, leadership, and then turn things to my colleague, Bradford Wilkie, to walk you through the rest of the essentials. So let's start with our first element, you, as the leader of your organization. Why this emphasis on leadership? Well, the first reason, as I touched on earlier, is that cybersecurity has broad implications for every aspect of your organization and the success of your business. Therefore, addressing it requires buy-in and influence from the top. It starts really with you. It's a common misconception that cybersecurity is something that is the sole domain of your IT department or your CISO, that cyber risks can be mitigated simply by writing checks to your CIO. As leaders, you influence your organization in diverse and far-reaching ways such as the ways you define and embody the culture of your organization or establish organizational priorities, the ways that you establish perspective and expectations for your employees, 
how you direct financial investment, and what you do to safeguard resiliency across your business. Each of these roles has a direct impact on your organization's cyber readiness or lack thereof. That is why much of this presentation will focus on your role as a cyber leader, whether you come from a technology background or not. As a leader, you are at the top of the organizational structure that influences cyber readiness within the culture of your business. Your task is to drive cybersecurity strategy, investment, and yes, culture within your teams. To do this, you need to start small, but start somewhere. Policy can be the starting point of a discussion with over lunch. It can be a discussion during a coffee break in the morning. It can be something you take up with a section of your team or do during regular team meetings. It can be a casual conversation or something more structured. The key is to begin the conversation within your organization. You don't want the only conversation about cybersecurity do's and don'ts to occur, occur after a cyber incident. So starting small, starting with these types of leadership practices really is going to drive an understanding in your organization that you have personal skin in the game, that you're trying to take a leadership position with cybersecurity. You're trying to drive investments, action, and you're setting aside the time necessary to create the repeatable processes to make these ideas sticky within your leadership team. And again, all of this really starts with you. In working with your IT partners and staff, one of those hard conversations is striking the right balance between policy and practice. Here, we just need you to take a look at the beginning of what cyber policy may mean in terms of a journey within your organization. And here I'm talking about policy with a small p. But policy with a small p can pay big dividends later by helping you establish the right behaviors, including ideas like shared responsibility between your IT staff and the other staff within your organization. Start with what you might think is a reasonable set of boundaries or practices. Things like acceptable use of the internet or internet browsing activities, device mobility, etc. And then use those as a conversation starter with your IT staff, with your partners, and across your workforce to see what kinds of policies might assist in your success. Ultimately, what we mean by success is this reducing the risk and exposure of your organization and limiting the impact of a cyber incident should it occur to your business. I'm gonna hand over the conversation to my colleague, Bradford Wilkie. Bradford's gonna run you through the rest of the pillars, but I wanna leave you with a final thought. Don't forget that leadership today really leverages partnerships tomorrow. You're in the driver's seat, but you're not alone in this effort and have access to a capable community of partners that can work with you on this cybersecurity journey. And I sincerely hope that you will consider CISA as one of those partners as you take the steps necessary to protect your organization and your business. Thank you again, and I enjoyed this opportunity to present to you. Well, thank you very much, Trent. I mean, that was a very good overview uh, of, of sort of the thinking behind it and some of the key tenets that go into uh, how CISA thinks about uh, the, the public-private partnership and the role of the private sector. Um, I, I, I wanted to just ask you a question, but before that, I wanted to say I did uh, take some time to refresh myself yesterday uh, on the cyber essentials and found that um, one of the things I thought was really good was you, you outline the, uh, you know, the key essential and then you go through who does it apply to and then, you know, what do you need to do? And then there are very concrete links and very specific links to where people can find additional information on a specific subcategory. So that's really important. So it's not only the theory, but it's the practice. And I think, you know, I think our audience should definitely take a look at, uh, at, the, at this and use it as a dynamic document because I think it's very useful. But one of the things I did want to ask you and, you, and you sort of alluded to it in your remarks, it's, you know, it's, it's common to hear people talk about the chasm between IT departments and uh, other operations such as sales, finance, cybersecurity, or even the C-suite. Um, you know, people think that cybersecurity is a cost rather than, you know, rather than an investment. And how do you see the cyber essentials bridging the gap between, between those uh, departments or between those types of ideas? And, and how can it dispel some of the misconceptions about the value of cybersecurity? 
Well, I, th- I think there's two aspects that we intend the Cyber Essentials to help build a bridge between your, your IT team and, and, frankly, your IT partners, uh, both within and outside of your organization and the broader workforce and, and leadership within your organization. One, of course, is that it empowers you as leadership within your organization with the kinds of information you need to ask informed questions to really understand what prevalent cyber risks or threats might confront your organization and what steps your IT team are doing to address those those risks, but but also what steps you as leadership and the workforce within your organization can do to both embolden and empower that IT team, but also work with them in partnership to make those efforts successful. I think that's critical because those conversations are the basis for how you'll establish formal policy and practice within the organization, how you'll shape the culture of the organization, and ultimately the the investments that you will make to contextualize the broad guidance that agencies like ours can offer you to, to the more specific requirements and challenges that your specific business may encounter in the environment. The second thing that I hope the Cyber Essentials will do for you is is help you be an informed com- consumer of the kinds of services that I know folks like Spencer are going to talk about in greater detail later today. So that you can understand how those services ultimately are designed to support your business, not just from a cybersecurity perspective, but from a broader resiliency perspective, so that you're taking the actions and making the investments necessary to really protect your organization from emerging threats um, as they occur across the horizon. So I think those are two critical actions that we hope that that the Cyber Essentials will be an important bridge for leadership within small business. Well, thank you. That was a that was a very uh, I think thoughtful response, and um, you know it's clear that you guys have, have given this a lot of thought. You've engaged a lot across private sector and within the government, and and really came up with a very uh, helpful and useful product. So I do have um, so thank you for all of that. And uh, we are going to turn to uh, Bradford in just a second, but uh, I see here we do have some responses to the first question, uh, the poll question. So the number one answer. So the question was. How, what's your breaking point when it comes to how a ransomware attack would affect your organization? So the number one answer at 54% is we can't or won't pay, and we also don't know how bad things might get, but we have a recovery and or a restoration plan. So that's good. Better than half have a, a recovery or restoration plan. Uh, second uh, most uh, common answer was it might come down to how much we would have to pay, but we know what security and resilience information we will use to make those decisions during an attack. That's 25%. Um, the third at 16% is we don't have one because we're confident we can prevent, respond, contain, and or recover without paying and without much of a blimp, a blip in operations, 16%. And 5% will probably pay if it's not outrageous because we know it would be bad, uh, i.e. highly impactful or, disrupt, or disruptive and not an easy recovery. So look, I think this is, it's interesting. I, I have my thoughts on, I think it's, it sounds like people are, are planning and acting and and also, you know, want to don't want to roll over. But Trent, what do you what what's your what does this tell you? Well, it's encouraging from one perspective, but also I think worthy of continued conversation from from a different perspective. It's certainly encouraging that mem- that that a number of the respondents feel that they have taken steps to protect their organizations so that in such a way that they can ultimately recover should their organization be a victim of ransomware or a ransomware attack. The 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 other perspective that I would that I would highlight though is that notion that we don't know how bad it would get. And I think that's a critical perspective to consider when you're thinking about how resilient your business is from these various kinds of threats. Truly having a a, a defined sense of where you're vulnerable and the relationships across digital platforms that you utilize to support your business and its operations is going to be key to understanding your exposure and to ensuring that you're taking all of the necessary measures to, to address that exposure and reduce the impact should you uh, experience one of these attacks. So while I think it's encouraging that folks feel a sense of preparedness, I would also encourage the respondents and participants today to take a hard look at, at the depth of understanding that they have within their organization about that exposure and, and where they might uh, have vulnerabilities that have gone unaddressed and, and take steps to address those vulnerabilities as appropriate. Yeah, I think that's right. Sometimes, sometimes you don't know what you don't know. So it's always good to be constantly 
uh, probing and and seeing where you may be vulnerable, where you may not know it. But listen, Trent, thank you very much for your time, for your insights. Um, it was it was very interesting, very very useful. Uh, and now we're going to turn it over to Bradford to walk us through the five pillars of the Cyber Essential Schools Toolkit. So Bradford, the floor is yours. Hey, thanks, Chris. Uh, really excited to be here, and I really appreciate the opportunity with all the small businesses that are on the line, all the, the people that really make up the support network for them. So my special thanks to the Chamber for being a, a staunch supporter and a leader in small business cybersecurity. Is, is like you said, you've, you've been preaching these practices for a long time. I think one of the things we've really tried to strike home with the essentials is that you know codifying them in a, in a placemat, a couple toolkits, and some resources you can really get a jump start. So as Trent said, you can you can you should really take a start anywhere mentality when it comes to the essentials. I also, you know, I, my reflection on the poll, which you just covered, um, is that you know it, it there is some there's some good news and bad news there. I, I think you don't want to be without an answer. I think is one of the things, and I, we're hoping that in the essentials, as much as they sound like um, you know IT security practices. You, you really find that there's a business level conversation to be had. So, that, you know, a lot of what I'm going to talk about in these five pillars um, after the leadership pillar, which is really that first essential pillar out of the six. But these these next five, I'm re really sort of break down that business impact analysis, which, you know, it's not about IT security failures. It's about the business impacts. It's about the uh, disruption to operations, the ability not to make sales and payments, the ability not to pay your staff. Uh, understand your inventory, all the things that ransomware and other cyber threats kind of jam us up with. So I want to come back to that because it's it's a business impact that we're talking about. And what we're talking about is the divisional labor and the conversation that should happen from the senior leadership in a small business all the way down to the IT staff. But that does not circumvent the conversations you have to have with partners, with your workforce, um, you know, and and all the all the supporting cast, if you will. So um, it's great to be here, real privilege to be here with you, Chris, along with Spencer Ferguson, I think we're gonna turn to later, and, and of course, Trent Frazier, we just heard from. And so I wanna pick back right up after this leadership pillar uh, with the next essential element, which is your staff. Th that element, the staff is really, um, you know, where the rubber meets the road. That element, this element is really concerned with, you know, do we as the staff of an organization understand the accepted norms and online practices, the, the best practice that we're trying to exhibit um, in supporting our organization, you know, the appropriate use of data, appropriate use of the networks, um, expected use of the business process. And a couple of good questions to frame that what we're talking about when it comes to staff is, is the staff engaging in a risky online behavior? And what we don't mean is shame the victim, shame the, the end user into better practices, but do they understand how they're contributing and making you know, the work of the business done and what risk that really poses to the business if you know, they fall prey to clicking on that link or you know, they take the laptop home and it, it gets stolen um, or they use that dangerous Wi-Fi with a, a uh, business asset. And so, you know, there's other questions we've got to get through, like, um, have you set boundaries or guidance for online use, the basic do's and don'ts you want to see happening in your computing environment? What happens when it comes and how you treat information? Is information the lifeblood of your small business? It should be. So are you talking about the expected norms for information protection and handling? What constitutes acceptable use both at, at the workplace and more and more, as we just saw over the last two years or year and a half, is when you're taking those computing resources on the road, at home, in your new remote work, on travel. And you know, I, I think we've got to wrap our heads around what kind of conversation are we having, management to staff, uh, staff to the IT workforce. And the idea here is to increase your workforce's cyber knowledge and awareness as well as your own. And remember, cyber vulnerability and threat doesn't happen in a vacuum. It's, it's, it's not just about what the staff understands is acceptable, it's about affecting uh, what other you know, parties are in your supply chain. It's about making sure you understand staff and how they're contributing to the operating uh, partnerships in the environment that you have. So that this can't just be about a, a, your own sense of good cybersecurity awareness. It has to be about that extended bubble of awareness conversations that happen across the customer environment, business partners, um, you know, all the people that are upstream and downstream of a small business. 
And what we like to do is kind of wrap this up in the idea of cyber literacy. So for example, you could pass around an interesting or scary article that you read over the weekend to increase cyber literacy. But I think it really goes back to, you know, as you're trying to support the business processes, as you're trying to uh, you look at work roles, um, how do you bring cybersecurity best practice or discussions into those conversations? And if you look at scary stories, how can you bring those in for the perspective of lessons learned and take that back into the organization and have credible conversations? And that's really what focusing on the staff is for a small business. It's encouraging conversations with the, the other, other staff members and the organization across the management layers, the IT partners. You know, what would we do if this happened? How could we uh, get in front of this to make sure we are not so uh, face planted down if something like ransomware happens? How would we not fall prey to this type of event? How would our customers report something that they saw as a challenging element to our security goals? How would they report that back into us? So half of what uh, we're talking about is awareness. And the other half is training. And, and, you know, if you think about it, you train to procedures, you train as you would fight, uh, you know, issues and problems coming up. And training becomes the cornerstone of cyber hygiene, um, you know, but it really doesn't have to be that costly or time intensive. So the training I'm talking about is really lowercase t training. And it's the ability for you to have a lunch and learn. It's ability for you to participate in this chamber event, visit your local chamber of commerce that might have resources, you know, visit the small business development center at the local university, talk to the small business loan provider and see if they have some recommended resources for uh, cybersecurity training. The last thing they want is your loan not to be their, their loan not to be paid because you've got a cyber event that's preventing that. Um, and finally, Whatever you do, you need to enlist the, the, the trust and open communications across the staff and the management in small businesses for this to really work and be efficient. Um, treating staff as a vulnerability, treating your staff as a threat um, is, is really not the way to create a healthy relationship. And so, um, you know, seeing them as a place to uh, place blame as, as when events happen or not creating a culture uh, that really um, creates open conversation is, is going to put staff, staff at an arm's distance, and it's not really going to create um, the environment that you need. So, you know, we really encourage you to have open conversations, no fault finding, talk about the positives, what you want to see working in the environment, not just the, the don'ts of the environment. Um, as, we, as we look at other pillars and we shift to things like your systems, I want to talk about the next three layers of the essentials, which is um, really in tandem with one another. And so um, I'm going to talk about your systems, the surroundings, and the data environment. So we've talked about leaders and we've talked about the staff, but it, the rubber also then meets the road with the system and the, the, the IT environment that small businesses have that's doing a lot of the you know, the business process, um, it's underpinning the way in which you look at inventory, uh, the way in which you're going to affect recovery, those types of things. So these next three areas are really going to break down the technology view of your environment. And we're going to talk about your systems, and then we're going to pivot to your surroundings, and then finally your data. So let's, let's start with systems. Um, the systems really aspect and the essentials refers to, you know, the system of controls that you have within your cyber readiness culture. So these are the processes, the physical and digital infrastructure that really make you an operational small business. And these are the closest thing when you come to business impact analysis, that when you say, how would we not be able to make payroll or understand our inventory, you're gonna pivot to data, people accessing and managing that through the business process and the IT system software, operating systems and the network environment that all of that relies on. So that's really the three legs of the stool we're talking about. The, the best concept really of wrapping your head around this is business impact analysis. And probably second to that would be continuity planning, which usually falls from that kind of impact analysis. So when someone says, what business impacts do you want to plan for against disruptions, destructions, or, you know, uh, you, know you, you want to have a game plan in mind. You want to be able to say that you are motivated to continue business communications with customers, partners, and vendors. You want to be able to say how email and applications, um, you know, that are doing inventory control really contribute to the business. 
So the your systems part that we're aiming at to apply the essentials at are indeed linked to the areas that are really driving the heart of the business um, and what, how the work is divided, the process and the achieving the business uh, objectives. So your, your task as a leader and some of the staff here is to identify what are the critical assets. I'm going to come back to them as sort of the crown jewels. But the whole idea is that we shape our protections uh, around the things that are most important that are really required to run the business. And they all reside within your business environment. We just have to figure out how to identify them and put protections against them. So maintaining inventories of hardware and software assets is a really good way to start thinking about this because you're planning the attack surface out of what the bad guys are really going after. They're gonna go after how to disrupt your business. Ransomware is a great example where they just sort of blanket your entire IT environment with a, a large disruption that doesn't allow any business practice to, um, to actually a, a, a be achieved or occur. But you know, away from ransomware, there's den denial of service, there's malicious code, there's um, fraud attacks, all things that sort of, uh, you know, attack the business process at a, at a smaller scale than ransomware does. And so as a leader, we have to really get curious about what you want to see um, come out of that business impact analysis, that that continuity planning and that event planning that's going to drive your incident response and your, your recovery preparedness actions. So that during an incident, the last thing you want to do is, is play a game of Clue where you're saying, where are the assets? Who has access to them? What's the game plan? What software and, and IT environment are they residing on? And, and how do we get all this going? You want to plan and map all that out. Getting curious means you roll up your sleeves, start digging into the details, and start pulling the questions in that you're going to hand over and talk about with your IT team. And you ask more questions in this uh, phase that you can probably answer, um, and that's okay. The, the, the idea is not to get uncomfortable so you can't move forward and get jammed up. It's to understand where you've got known answers that you're working on that have a, uh, you know, a planned out way of, of responding to certain types of cybersecurity events and which ones still need some game planning. Another uh, task is to make it harder for the bad guys and close down the easy avenues of attack. And so when you look at your systems, we're talking about things like patching the security holes, making sure software is up to date removing unnecessary features and applications that we just don't need because if we're not using them, they're going to eventually manage us if they become the weakest link vulnerability into our environment. Um, what we need to do is, you know, figure out if, if after a major update, have we backed up the system so that once, if something happens in terms of disruption, we can restore to the best known good IT environment. And if we really don't need things in our environment, the idea is to you know, rip them out, reduce our footprint, et cetera. It, no different than looking around at how many exit doors do you need? How many entry doors do you need? Where do you need cameras? You know, you need those because you're trying to get an understanding of where the assets are and you're trying to reduce the vulnerability and threat opportunities and avenues. So the best way, again, to start that is to look at your system footprint, your applications, your IT systems. The second best way is to get a handle of your surroundings. And if you think about a small business environment, you've got customers who come into a waiting area, maybe they come into a foyer, maybe they come into the sales area, maybe they're in the back office a little bit, um, it, depending on what type of business. But you basically lock customers into one area and the labor and workforce and the partners into another area. And, and talking about your surroundings is that second leg of the stool, you're really trying to figure out who's in the zoo when it comes to your IT environment. So I want you to think of your IT environment as you do that physical office space. Access to the office suite is probably granted by a badge or a key card, you know, and that's done to verify employees. You train measures so that people don't follow, a customer doesn't follow you into the back office, doesn't follow you into your warehouse. Employees are pretty much reminded, you know, um, how to report suspicious activity, that adage of see something, say something. So if a customer walked into the, the break room, they'd be like, hey, can I help you? You don't really need to be here. If they walked in the back door, you'd tell them something. The IT environment is the same way and the same principles apply. The only difference is the tools that you need to use to really do that. So instead of key cards and security guards and automated locks and see something, say something, um, it, with using staff, we use account management. We use least privilege. We use vendor and third party uh, access controls when they come through the networks uh, over virtual private networks or remote access. 
And by online actors, I don't mean to say bad actors. I mean to say the end users that are using your computing environment, whether it's the privileged administrators, the account owners, the, the end users, you know, we have to figure out all those boundaries of the, uh, of, the, of the environment. And I've sat down with hundreds of businesses, many of them smaller ones, um, and it uh, has always caught to this area where um, we start with talking about the contract team that's supporting the IT department or the IT team, and they really only come in once a month or maybe every other Thursday. And the whole point is in this area is to challenge them with conversations. You know, ask them who, what is our user footprint in the environment? Are we paying attention to how we provision uh, accounts for our end users, for contractors, for vendors? Those people that come into patch systems are given privileges that that end users doing data entry really don't have in our systems. And so we need to be asking the team how do we pro- put more controls, more authentication, different types of identity management controls on top of that. Um, and if we're looking at all those fundamental things, we can't forget about the role of antivirus software and security things. They're going to help us with understanding and policing the do's and don'ts when it comes to, again, the end users, the vendors, the contractors that are using that IT environment. And so it sort of builds in due diligence by having antivirus, security software, and having a way that looks for how the user is engaging with the environment and putting some you know, some padding around them so that they're not in and alone, just trying to just d- decide the best thing to do or not to do. Um, and, and just as you would do, I think, at the end of the day, walking around an office, if you're a nine to five shop, you're not 24 seven, you know, you check in on employees, you make sure that the office and the entry exit doors are locked before the weekend. You think about changing the keys when, you know, that disruptive employee is terminated and leaves your organization. Um, so there are some fundamental things in this area of understanding your surroundings where, you know, if someone leaves and they had access remotely to the crown jewels of the IT environment, we would terminate their account. We would remove it. We would maybe monitor it if we couldn't terminate, if it was a joint account for a vendor. You know, we would translate that into some security controls and actions and the conversation that goes back to the staff and the leadership to, to plan all this out. Finally, the the final leg of the stool when it comes to the IT environment is the data. And we probably should have started with that because, as they say, the data is the lifeblood of an organization. But this is really about identifying the key information of the business and then look at how it's being protected. So we're talking about both access to the data that we talked about in the surroundings, the who has access to what data from what point in, in time and space, And we're also looking at the protocols that are put in place to protect that data, recover it when needed. And we're making sure we ask this question about sufficiency and adequacy. So, you know, a a good uh, clear example here is backing up data, which is one of those fundamental things that the White House was talking about that Chris Roberti said. You know, you you can't restore your business if you don't have good uh, backups of the data and good backups of the IT environment. So a fundamental thing here is really understanding what are the business needs to back up the IT record keeping, um, the system configurations, the running state of accounts, you know, all of that is part of that data footprint that you have. And you need to ask yourself if a certain record were unavailable, if it was modified without permission, if it was disrupted or disclosed to somebody outside of the organization, how much pain would the organization feel? And again, this is the business impact analysis that really drives that small S strategy that you can talk about with your IT team and saying, look, that's going to drive our backup plan. It's going to put integrity controls into place. It's going to allow us to understand uh, least privilege when it comes to assigning accounts. It's going to help us understand who needs remote access to systems, applications, and data, and who doesn't need that access. So remember, protecting information You've got to really protect it from, you know, the, the user, you know, um, you know, sort of easy button stuff of like, don't take the crown jewels home on a laptop that's not encrypted. It's going to connect to the Starbucks Wi-Fi, those types of things. But I think more sophisticated than that, we're talking about, you know, making sure that the data has some fundamental protection from viruses, malicious code. You know, and making sure those basic block and tackling software like antivirus is is part of your you know essential activities. 
And when you think about ransomware and your need to restore data, you need to think about um, the quality of the backups, the timeliness and the currency of the information that you're backing up, um, and how you test the recovery plans. It's it's one thing to say, yep, I'm confident that we can re uh, restore our operations because we've got really good backups that are really up to date. But you've got to make sure you test that recovery procedure. If you if it's going to take 24 hours to reload your system environment, get the data back up, provision new accounts, get your business cart partners and your vendors to start to get access, you've got to know that as part of your recovery planning. So talk to your IT team and, and do those ask and answer kind of question sessions where, you know, you, you ask things like, what is going to be restored first in our environment if we have ransomware and we are restoring from good backups? And, you know, what's going to be the 500 thing down the list that's going to have to be restored if you have 500 pieces of software, 500 users and 500 uh, IT devices? I know that's kind of cheeky, but I think it's not about what's 500th. It's about what's the first, second, and third priorities to get back and going. And that makes a big difference. If you're uh, a very small shop and you've got to get inventory, payroll, and payment processing up, you've got to be able to identify the systems that are really um, the systems of software and that data footprint that's got to be restored before all those other secondary systems. Again, that's why I keep coming back to business impact analysis. It tells you where the high, uh, high risk, high impact, uh, most critical crown jewels are of your of your organization, and so, with kind of that IT environment, the the user and the leadership conversation all buttoned up now, I want to turn attention to the last, most probably most important um, uh, pillar of the cyber essentials, especially when you consider. Things fail. Ransomware does happen. Bad guys do get in. You're reading more and more about it. So I don't, I'm not going to approach this from a fatalistic view, but this last area uh, of the essentials called your crisis response is making sure that it is your game plan, your best recipe to recover and restore and regain confidence that you have a well-defended environment. So this element is all about planning so that you're agile, you're planning for failure, you're planning for that bad weather event. And basically you're being honest with the limitations that you have, how quickly you're gonna be able to restore and how many resources need to be pulled in to help you affect that kind of recovery. So the point here is that if you don't have a game plan, it's gonna take longer. The scale of time, the procedures, the bad guy's gonna win because they're, they're basically hamstringing you because you don't have maybe at all uh, chalked out as to who's making decisions, what data gets uh, restored in what order, how long does it take, how many people do you need to call in uh, to help affect the recovery. So it's about planning out that game plan and then testing it, exercising it, and then making sure it works for your goals. Part of the game plan needs to focus on, you know, the decision process and the roles that you have in the incident. So think about how you assign actions, um, who's going to be doing what in the middle of a firefighting activity, who's going to be working with a uh, corporate communications with customers, service providers, and business partners, who's going to be working with legal counsel, who's going to be working with an organization like CISA that you're calling for technical assistance, who's going to be working with uh, your IT team if they're a contract staff, and you know how are you going to divide and conquer your restoration and recovery. Um, the other parts that you need to think about Again, or go back to that business impact analysis and the crown jewels of the business. And one of the links there is, you know, if I'm manufacturing and I need to get the manufacturing run up or I'm in sales and I need to get the storefront back open, you're going to prioritize those systems, those personnel, those accounts and that data to be able to get that most important business function back into place, restore it, recover and execute the business and, and with confidence that you're back to normal. So your, your game plan is all about those fundamentals that we've talked about, but it's also got to make room for improving the defenses that were really weak that led you into that. So it's not just about recovering back to normal from backups. It's about learning and improving from what you just had when you had um, that failure or when you had that disruption. It's about improving that security posture. And, you know, you don't need to think about uh, all of this alone. You know, there's law enforcement out there. There's outside legal counsel that's very conversant and cyber savvy these days. You've got a friend in CISA here. You've got your IT service providers. They've probably helped other small businesses face that 
very foul weather uh, day where they're responding to an event, coaching them through the recovery, getting them, uh, you know, to understand the priorities or getting to understand the priorities of the small business and what they need to recover. And so the, the whole point here is, you know, as you're thinking about a, yourself and your leadership role, as you're thinking about your staff, as you're thinking about the surroundings and the system and the data and your response planning, you are not in it alone. You've got great partners with the chamber. You've got great partners in CISA. And your phone a friend network is something we absolutely think you should map out. But when the foul weather day comes, whether it's ransomware, denial of service, remote access compromise, or something as, uh, as uh, not simple, but as aggravating as a virus, um, you've got friends out there to help with. You're not in it alone. And I'll go back to uh, just very quickly as I wrap up that the essentials that we discussed today are really just a starting point and hoping to facilitate and bridge that conversation from the technical side of your organizations with the business and the leadership and the partnership side of your organizations and really drive that cyber readiness home as part of your culture. Um, but I want to go back to those fundamental actions because I think they really uh, they, they really drive home um, these these things that really should be on your fast list punch list for walking out the uh, for away from the webinar today. So earlier this month, as you heard, uh, as you heard uh, Chris Roberti say, the White House published a list of five actions that the U.S. government thinks that all business leaders, large and small, should be really taking, you know hugging close and getting done, backing up your data, making sure you have system images and configurations, regularly testing them and keeping those backups offline so that if the system crashes, you don't have all eggs in one basket. Updating and patching systems promptly. The bad guys are leveraging the window of time between when a patch is available to when you're actually applying it. So if you're 10 to 14 days between when the patch is available and applying it, the bad guys are trying to really get in there at, at you know, within that window of your um, change, your change management and in your plan for patching systems. And they're constantly closing that window and making um, the way they leverage and conduct attacks even more sophisticated, more automated. So updating and patching systems as promptly as possible shaves and, you know, it saves you a lot and it shaves your attack surface, meaning the uh, exposure that you provide to the enemy, the adversary, gets shrunk every time you rapidly patch systems and make them up to date, security software, uh, and just full full up to the patch um, uh, to the patch baselines. You should also test your incident response plan. You know the best laid plans on paper are great, but you need to train them, exercise them. You need to you know, do that minute drill on a Friday before everybody quits for the weekend and, and do that lunch and learn. You need to take time to have that conversation about who's doing what, who's going to get the data, who's working with law enforcement, who's making decisions. And you need to check the work of your security team. And what that means is every once in a while, you know, ask a small business and their IT group how they stress test themselves. You know, have an audit done. Uh, go to your local chamber and see if they have a uh, an assessment that is free. Come to CISA and and ask us to do one of our security assessments for free. You know, check the work of your it's it's that trust but verify aspect. And then finally, the one that the White House stresses really segment your networks. And I think this really goes to some of the things we saw in JBS as a ransomware attack recently. Even before that, we saw with uh, Colonial Pipeline. And I know those are large enterprises. But if you're a small business and you have business operations and customer side operations, you've got, um, you know, an operation facility that you're manufacturing widgets out of and you've got a business side. It's about segmenting the operation side from the business, uh, the business information. It's about segmenting the customer's interface from the from the, the back, uh, the back office interfaces. And if you don't, you find that ransomware spreads like wildfire is one example uh, where segmentation really matters. So in all this, I want you to check out the Cyber Essentials starting kit. And I want you to do what Trent said up at the top, which is read that kit. Don't think of it as a punch list. Start somewhere on there. If you see a foothold where you're getting 50% of the practices done in the staffing element or the recovering planning element, look at the other areas that you can punch down on. You know, look at the compilation of toolkits that we have, the links to the resources, 
you know, do your own, uh, you know, research on the on the weekend, punch around those toolkits, ask us questions. And what we really want to know is, you know, which of those practices are built into the fundamental things that you're doing today? Which of those are going to be stress, uh, stress, uh, stretch goals for you that you may struggle to implement? Because the last thing we want to do is be on high on our horse and say, these are the right things to do and find that they are completely, you know, um, inefficient, they are costly. And what we want to do is look at, is there, a, is there a different practice you can put into place? Is there a lower cost or no cost way? Is there time and effort, which is what you have in maybe abundance, but you don't have in terms of financial capital to put these practices into place? So we really do want to understand if these make sense, how much struggle and how much effort will you have? What's the annualized cost that it would take to implement those things? And we want to work with you because we want to facilitate an efficient and effective, you know, lowest cost way to do this. But we really need to hear your feedback in order to, to finally hone this essentials. So in addition to the um, White House guidance, the cyber essentials, if I could throw one more plug out there, I, I'd ask that you surf over to us at CISA.gov and check out our CISA ransomware guide. A lot of the same practices um, that are in the essentials are in that ransomware guide, but there's even more tips for you and how to protect your business, how to protect yourself at home, and, and how to really get ahead of the, the threat of ransomware. And again, you can access all these resources that I talked about today by visiting us at CISA.gov. Thanks for your time today, and I know we got questions and, uh, and we wanna hear from uh, Spencer. So I'm gonna toss it back to uh, good friend, Chris Roberti. Chris? Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Vince Hosey here with the U.S. Chamber. Thanks to our friends and partners at CISA, uh, Trent and Bradford for the illuminative discussion on the cyber essentials. Uh, for folks that are looking for more information, um, as Bradford mentioned at the end, cisa.gov slash cyber dash essentials is your home base for that. Um, I'd like to bring in uh, a good friend of the chamber, Spencer Ferguson, who is the founder and CEO of Allsedge IT which is one of Utah's largest uh, locally owned um, managed IT and network services companies servicing over 500 uh, small businesses. So Spencer, welcome, good morning. Thanks for being here with us. Um, I'd like to get through as many as the, of the audience questions in, in the last couple of minutes that we have left. Mm -hmm. uh, but first, you know, can you talk a little bit about kind of what, what advantages managed IT services and managed cybersecurity services um, could provide to small and mid-sized businesses? Um, where do you see organizations grow from, okay, well, we've done the basic checklist, we need more and they've recognized that they need to go outside of their network for help. And so can you talk a little bit about where, um, where a firm like yours can, can help play a role in cyber defense? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much, Vince. Uh, our role for our, our customers, we serve about 500 of them, uh, as you mentioned, is in tech support and cybersecurity. So our customers, uh, some of them have a handful of computers, some of them have a thousand computer systems and we're still there to help them with their networks, their servers, their workstations and mobile devices uh, regardless. And our customers are very diverse. They're in manufacturing, healthcare, professional services, nonprofits, uh, very diverse across the range of industries that we serve as well. Uh, but really we're there to make sure that our customers are, are maturing. Uh, they're all in different, uh, different parts of their cyber security journeys, but we're trying to always help them mature and become more and more secure over time and uh, helping them with their policies. Uh, we're the boots on the ground that are implementing all the things that Bradford was talking about, making sure that the data backups uh, are taking place and, and are being done properly. Multi-factor authentication, setting that up for our customers, uh, putting endpoint detection response in place, as well as encryption. And uh, so we're really the boots on the ground to assist those small and medium sized businesses uh, with all those uh, tech support and cybersecurity needs. So we got a really interesting question, I think goes to, to some of the, the crux of, of this small business community. You know, most businesses are mom and pop shops. Mm -hmm. um, they don't have servers, they don't have security badges. Um, they run a handful of computers and have no IT department. And, you know, what's what's your recommended approach for building a cybersecurity risk management program from for the ground up? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And you really want to make sure that you uh, first get leadership buy-in. I know Bradford and uh, uh, some of our previous speakers mentioned that. 
Uh, make sure that your leadership team knows that the threat is real and that you are willing to uh, give the budget and time and energy uh, that is necessary to make sure that uh, you are able to secure your business. Then engage an expert. Uh, you know, Wasatch IT, we look at ourselves as experts in the field, certainly. Uh, but find an expert uh, who's willing to come in and do a gap assessment for you uh, that can really say, okay, hey, here are your, your five, ten biggest risks. Let's start chipping away at these things to help you get more and more secure. Uh, at Wasatch IT, we really recommend that every business uh, assigns a cybersecurity month. So every single year, you go in and you look at your policies, you look at your procedures, you look at any, uh, you do a gap assessment, you put in security awareness training for all of your employees, and uh, and then do that every single year on the same month to make sure that you're uh, you're staying up to date and, and continually securing your business. It's perfect because you know one of the things that that Bradford talked about, one of the things Anne talked about in her open letter was was the importance of patching, and, and that was certainly on display with the uh, the Microsoft Exchange and Hackdam attack that a patch was deployed, and then you know over a series of days and weeks, uh, the number of organizations that had deployed that patch had had, had significantly decreased, but there was a significant amount of risk. Um, can you talk about the importance of patching um, in, in some of that gap analysis? What does a good patch program look like um, for you? And as you saw from the results of the poll, you know, maybe about 60% of organizations have, have a patch program. So I wonder if you could offer a few reflections on, on the importance of patching for a risk management program for small business. Yeah, certainly. And, and patching is something that would certainly come up in a gap assessment that uh, you know the experts that you bring in would do. And uh, patching is certainly a balance between productivity and security, right? We want to make sure that we're getting those, uh, those uh, security patches out there and, uh, and implemented as soon as possible. Uh, but it's important to test them first to make sure that there's no adverse reaction to your productivity. Um, and so it's about having that balance, about having a process that you use to get those things uh, uh, implemented as soon as possible. And so there does need to be a policy that your IT team is uh, following there. So. Uh, ask your IT team, do you have a, a patch management policy and uh, make them give that policy to you and read it and, and make sure that uh, you feel it's adequate for securing your business in a, a quick and efficient way. Let's talk about uh, data backups for, for a couple of minutes here. We talked um, uh, and asked a question. It seemed like almost a majority of respondents have some sort of data backup program in place. They either um, have a comprehensive backup plan, it's tested, um, about 50%, just a little over that, have uh, store those backups offline. Uh, and we just got this interesting question in. Uh, a couple of times it's been mentioned that prior versions can be used as restoration points. Is there an effective way to determine whether or not those prior versions have been affected by a security event that requires their usage? Any thoughts on, on that one? Absolutely. In addition to having backups and make sure that, uh, you know, they're, uh, you're sending them off site and even having uh, offline backups that uh, can't be touched by a potential security threat such as ransomware. Uh, it's important to test those backups on a regular basis and, and make sure that they're going to mount and load and you have access to the actual data uh, to make sure that you wouldn't perhaps have to pay a ransom if you were infected. That's great. Um, and, and since you mentioned ransomware, I was wondering, you know, I, you, you must be dealing with this with a number of different clients. I'd uh, love to give you a chance to talk a little bit about some of those first-hand experiences on, on how this is impacting your small business clients, um, what you're coaching them on from either a leadership standpoint, an IT and risk management standpoint, um, of what they should be doing to reduce their risk. Yeah, and it's, it's really sad. You know, we deal with this all too often, unfortunately. And our customers who are more mature, who really have decided to engage with us uh, in making sure that they have the policies and procedures and cybersecurity awareness training and uh, proper backups and uh, encryption and all those things in place, those who engage that actually experience an event, uh, the impact is very minimal. Uh, maybe it's a small amount of, do of downtime or something of that nature. Uh, then there's those customers that unfortunately, you know, are less mature and uh, maybe haven't been following or listening to the recommendations that get hit with uh, an incident. And those customers, they, they really do suffer very severe uh, and adverse effects. You know, they have uh, sometimes weeks of downtime. 
Uh, sometimes they, they never get access to their data again. They don't know who owes them money, who they owe money to. They, they lose their customer lists. Uh, they lose other proprietary information. And, uh, you know, if, if and when the, you know, the, the encryption key that they, they buy from the hackers uh, even works, uh, you know, they've already suffered very severe financial difficulties. And we've even seen businesses uh, that didn't make it through uh, those types of adverse, uh, adverse reactions. So please engage with uh, some cybersecurity experts and uh, make sure that you're letting them do a gap assessment. You're assigning the budget that needs to be assigned to, uh, to mitigate any risks that you have and uh, make sure that you're following those risks as a business and, and you're getting into a rhythm to repeatedly uh, engage with them and, uh, and, follow the, and follow their advice. Spencer, thanks so much for, for being with us today. We're about at the end of the program, so I'll, I'll set, spend a few moments just closing us out. Mm -hmm. Really appreciate um, you uh, get, putting a fine point on some of the cyber essentials that Trent and, and Bradford walked through in great detail. Um, and, and just to re-highlight you know, the really important um, practices that both the White House and the Chamber have, have talked about uh, extensively about in the program here today. One, organizations um, should adopt and deploy multi-factor authentication. Um, two, encrypting as much, uh, of, especially of your crown jewels, um, uh, data uh, and communications, uh, encrypting, using encryption. Uh, three, the importance of, of backing up um, crown jewels, storing them offline, um, testing them to ensure that uh, they can be deployed if there is a ransomware or another uh, disruptive event. event. Um, the fourth, using your endpoint detection and response um, capabilities. And lastly, um, when you do outgrow the basics, employing and empowering a security team, uh, whether that's a firm like Wasatch IT um, or another cybersecurity provider, um, go out. Um, become an expert, become a leader on cyber issues. I want to thank um, our friends at CISA uh, and, and Spencer, of course, for, for being with us today. Um, this concludes the program today, uh, but we encourage um, everyone to continue to ask us questions, continue to reach out to the chamber um, and to your IT service providers uh, to take those fundamental steps. With that, um, this program is adjourned. Thank you, and uh, we look forward to seeing you at the next one.